Thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Robin Bagley. I'm a graduate student at the University of Kentucky in Catherine Lennon's lab. And today I'd like to share with you some of the work I've been doing with the red-headed pine softfly. Okay, so you've probably heard this about 25 times at this meeting, but in case you haven't, plant-eating insects make up an enormous amount of diversity on the planet, consisting of over a quarter of the described species on Earth. And this incredible diversity seems to be directly linked to the fact that they eat plants. So studies have shown that shifts to plant feeding from other types of insect lifestyles are consistently associated with increased diversification. But the reason for this diversification has been a little unclear. One hypothesis that's gained steam in recent years is that shifts and subsequent adaptation to these new host plants actually promotes insect speciation. So one taxa in which this host-driven speciation has been long suspected to occur are neodymium softflies. So these guys have a pretty typical insect life cycle the females and the males will mate on the host plant, and the female will lay her eggs actually inside of the tissue of their pine tree hosts. The larvae will then hatch and feed on the needles of the host, and then when they complete their development, they will spin up cocoons either on the host material or directly beneath the host tree in the soil. This really tight association with their host plant is thought to facilitate the process of host-driven speciation. Okay, so further supporting this idea, is the work of my PhD mentor, Catherine Lynn. So during her dissertation, she constructed this phylogeny with a couple of nuclear genes, and she also collected host data. So that's shown in these boxes here. The colored boxes represent a host that that species of soft life typically uses. The open boxes are ones that they don't use. So you can see a lot of variation in these host use patterns, but, but the important thing for this, for this talk is, is that what she found with this data is that host shifts actually coincide with the speciation events in the genus. What these data can't tell us, however, is when that host shift occurred. Did it actually happen before the speciation event and drive the speciation, or did it occur after speciation had already been initiated by some other mechanism? To figure that out, we need to look at much shallower levels of divergence before post-speciational changes can occur. So for my dissertation, I've been looking at a single species of softfly, the red-headed pine softfly, Neodiprion leconteii, which is widespread across Eastern North America and uses a wide range of hosts. If host-driven speciation is common in the genus, we would predict to see evidence of incipient speciation within this species. Specifically, we would predict to see three things. First, we would predict that population pairs on different hosts would be more genetically distinct than those on the same host. We would also predict that population pairs on different hosts would exhibit ecological divergence, and finally, that these ecologically divergent populations would show evidence of reproductive isolation that had been caused by that ecological divergence. So to address the first question, I went out and I sampled individuals from across its range and on most of the hosts, and I found, as you can see in this uh, map here, that there are three major clusters. Um, and each of these clusters occupies a different geographic area of the Eastern, United, Eastern North America. And they also harbor a distinct and largely non-overlapping set of host plants. This makes range-wide investigations of the role of host and population structuring rather difficult because differences in host use are conflated with just geographic distance. So instead of looking range-wide, I instead look within each one of these clusters. So here in these graphs, I'm showing you geographic distance x-axis and genetic distance on the y-axis. And each one of these points represents a population pair. If it's colored, they share a host. If it's open, they don't share a host. And I perform Mantel tests to investigate the correlation between basically their host distance, whether they share a host or don't, and their genetic distance while controlling for the geographic distance. And as you can see, in two of these three clusters, the pairs that are not found on the same host, so different, pair, different host pairs, actually have higher genetic divergence than the ones that are on the same host, regardless of sort of whatever geographic scale you look at. So this tells us that yes, range-wide, we do have population pairs from different hosts being more genetically divergent than those that share hosts. But it doesn't really tell us whether or not they're actually ecologically divergent or if they have any real reproductive isolation. So to quantify that, I've been working with softflies at the Arboretum. This is a facility that's located next to the University of Kentucky. And at the Arboretum, there's this wonderful path of pines, very creative name, I know, that's about 130 feet long and has planted specimens of three different host types. And all of these trees we've seen softflies on. So if we see evidence of host-driven divergence here, where they're in such close proximity that the branches of these trees often touch, 
it would be strong evidence for a general role of host use in driving differentiation within this species. So first, we're going to look at the first question. Do these guys actually show ecological divergence and evidence of adaptation to these different host plants? So why might these guys diverge to these host plants? You probably noticed on my previous slide that these trees look rather different even to someone that doesn't look at pine trees all day. But we were good scientists. We went out and we quantified these differences, and we found that they were indeed significantly differently um, had significantly different weights, uh, widths, I'm sorry, and significantly different lengths, with pitch pine being both the longest and the widest of these guys. So why might a sawfly care about the length or width of the needle that they use? Well, they're called sawflies because they literally saw into the needles of their host plant using a saw-shaped ovipositor. Now, when you're looking at this picture, you can imagine how making a mistake during this process would probably be bad for you. If you cut too deeply, you run the risk of cutting through all of the resin ducts and making the needle dry out and consequently your eggs drying out and dried out eggs don't hatch. On the opposite side, if you don't cut deeply enough, you run the risk of flooding your eggs with resin and making them drown. So if you're interested in hearing more about the consequences that differences in opposition can have in this genus, I encourage you to stay for the next talk in this session where my lab mate Emily will describe differences in opposition behavior between this species and its sister species. So getting back to the arboretum, uh, my undergrad Melanie Hurst took sawflies from each one of these hosts and she dissected out the autopositors, took a picture, and then laid landmarks to describe the overall shape of the autopositors. Um, so each, and then we put this into an R program called Geomorph, which does geometric morphometric analyses, and basically says, are these things differently shaped or not? So here I'm showing you a principal components analysis plot. Each point represents an individual. Um, Softlight's autopositor, points in yellow are from Pitch, green from Virginia, blue and shortleaf. That color will be consistent throughout this talk. Um, and this mostly looks like a gobbledygook of points when you first look at it, but you may see that the yellow points and the green points are kind of in different areas of morphological space. And this difference turns out to be significant. So even though neither one of these hosts has different, di significantly differently shaped autopositors than short leaf pine ones, we can say that there is a significant difference in the shapes of pitch pine autopositors and Virginia pine autopositors. So next we wanted to look at potential differences in the physiology. So to do this, we took offspring from females that were originally collected on one of the three hosts, and we offered them host material from either their natal host or one of the two alternative hosts. And then we reared them to cocoons, we weighed their cocoons, heavier cocoons are associated with more fecund individuals. Um, these are female cocoon mates only shown here. Um, and as you can see, with short, these are, um, these are all showing uh, sawflies whose mothers were collected from shortly fine. When we root them on these different hosts, they do get significantly different weights, but it's not in any sort of direction that we would predict. We see a similar pattern in Virgin with Virginia pine originating softflies, and although the pitch pine ones do attain the heaviest weight on pitch, we see that most of them get their heaviest weight in root on pitch. This is probably more indicative of nutritional differences between these hosts more than sort of adapted larval physiology. So we don't really see much evidence of sensical differential larval performance. So coming back to our predictions, we sort of have mixed evidence for this second bullet point. We do see differences in positive morphology, which is great, but we don't really see evidence of differential larval morphology. So next, let's take a look and see if there's any signs of reproductive isolation here. So first, we're going to look at female host acceptance. So for this experiment, we took a female from one of the three hosts and put her in a sleeve cage with one of the three types, either her natal host or one of the two alternatives. Then we basically look to see, do you lay eggs or do you not lay eggs? Um, starting with females from shortly fine, they kind of lay eggs on everything. They don't really care what you give them. But when we look at females from Virginia pine, we notice that while they will accept shortly pine and Virginia pine at an equal rate, they tend to reject pitch pine. This story gets even more interesting when we look at pitch pine females. They will readily accept their natal host, but reject both of the other hosts. So this may be evidence of partial habitat isolation originating from host avoidance in some of our host types of softwares. Okay, so next we want to see if there was any evidence of sexual isolation. So for this, we took a petri dish, we put a female softlight in it, and we offered her either a male from her same host type or a male from a different host type. Then we watched it for an hour and a half, and we scored whether or not they made it. Um, starting with 
pairs with short lead versus pitch, they, uh, there is no difference in the rate at which they accept the same host versus a different host mail. Same thing in pitch versus Virginia pairs, and same thing in short lead versus Virginia pairs. So this suggests that these guys are not sexually isolated, at least when you offer them a male in a dish they don't care who they meet with. They're not distinguishing between a same type male or a different type male. Okay, so the last thing we were interested in exploring was adult emergence times and whether or not there was any evidence for these guys being out at different times or being temporally isolated. So for this, we took sawflies from the wild and we brought them back in the lab. We then reared them, you know, feeding them their host that we collected them on until they spun up cocoons. We then monitored those cocoons and tracked daily how many adults emerged on that day from when emergence started to when emergence ended. And I want to point out that while they may have been collected at different times in the field, they were reared under equal conditions in the lab in a walk-in environmental chamber. So here I'm showing you first adults from Short Lake Pine, now adults from Virginia Pine, and finally adding in adults from Pitch Pine. So this may be a little hard to see with the bars, but if you look closely, you may notice the peak emergence for short leaf is different than the peak emergence for pitch pine is different from the peak emergence of Virginia pine. And I wanted to point out, I'm sorry, this is actually the proportion of total emergence, so every day I'm just showing you how much of the adults that emerge totally from that host emerge per day. Here's the data shown in a little bit of a different manner with lines instead of bars, and I think here you can see a little bit more clearly the difference between short leaf emergence, pitch emergence, and Virginia emergence. Now, if you're not familiar with sawflies, you might be looking at this and saying, those are only differences of maybe two or three days. Why is that important? Well, a sawfly lifespan in the wild is typically only two or three days. So even though these differences are small, that may be enough time to reduce the amount of chance that these guys have to encounter each other and actually start mating. So this may be, I haven't had time to do statistical analyses on this yet, unfortunately, but I think this might be compelling evidence for some signs of temporal isolation. So coming back to this, we once again see mixed evidence of the existence of reproductive isolation. So overall, we're finding some interesting patterns, but maybe not totally convincing evidence that at least at the Arboretum, we're seeing ecological divergence leading to reproductive isolation. There's a couple of reasons why this may be, including just that it hasn't been very long. These trees were planted in the mid to late 90s. Um, and we also know that inbreeding avoidance exists within this species. So it may, they may be more related when they're on a single host and be actively seeking out different host males to find less related partners. So next I'd like to actually do genetics within a single population and see if we can find patterns of um, genetic differentiation between these different hosts or if they kind of just all mesh into one thing. So with that, I'd like to thank lots of people, including my lab mates for doing most of the work here <laughs> and uh, the operator for letting me cut off pieces of their trees. And if I have time, I will take questions. Thanks. Looks like there isn't from what we have been able to do, um, but we're, we're still trying to figure out a way.